The God Seekers Movement presents of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask you to mark our hearts even now. In Jesus' name, amen. Very good. Very good. You can go ahead and be seated. I want to look at the uh, session of notes called The Seven Longings of the Human Heart. It's very important that we understand the longings that God put into our heart. Because the way that we understand our longings it affects how we relate to God and how we understand our own heart. If we misunderstand our longings, the enemy will come and create condemnation or confusion or frustration. But God created very specific longings and put them into the human spirit. And these longings were meant to draw us near to God and to reflect His glory in our life. And they express the creative genius of God, the way that He made us. And these longings express God's personality. We were made in His image. And the very longings that He created by His genius in us was enable us to walk with Him in deep companionship. It's important to understand that we cannot remove these longings by repenting of them. We can repent of seeking to fulfill them in a wrong way. But the longings themselves were created and put into us by God. And that we can only satisfy them in relationship with the Lord. People seek to satisfy these longings outside of the will of God. But they end up, uh, in the enemy confuses and brings condemnation to them. And so we can't repent of these longings, but rather we can repent of seeking to fulfill them in a wrong way. I want to identify seven of these longings. Number one longing. The longing for the assurance that we are enjoyed by God. Now think about this for a minute. It's the longing that I, I'm asking for less volume here because it's too loud. Okay. It's the longing for the assurance that we are enjoyed by God. That God put this desire in us. Not just that we would feel love, but we would actually fulfill feel enjoyed by the Lord. I'm going to go to John 15, 9 again, the verse I've looked at several times. Jesus said, as the Father loved me, this is the way that I love you. This is one of the most dramatic statements in the Bible. That God actually created us with a craving to be pursued by God. We have this deep longing to be delighted in and to be enjoyed by God. 
այսինքն որպեսի մենք ցանկանանք հոր աստված ձգտի մեզ մենք ցանկանում ենք որպեսի մենք հաճել լինենք ասուն որպեսի And when we when we have this longing fulfilled in the grace of God Եվ այս ձգտումը լրանում է աստծո շնորհքի մեջ Then it creates tremendous confidence in us Եվ դա ստեղծում է ահռելի շատ մեծ վստահություն մեզ անում Many people believe that God loves them but they don't actually believe he enjoys them Շատ մարդիկ հավատում են որ աստված սիրում են նրանց բայց իրականում չեն հավատում որ իրենք հաճելի են աստծուն And I believe that this confidence that he enjoys us is one of the greatest longings God built into the human spirit Եվ հավատում են որ վստահությունը այս մասին որ աստված վայելում է մեզ մենք հաճելի ենք նրան ամենա մեծ բանն է որ աստված դեդել է մեր հոգին Many believe that God enjoys us in heaven but not while we're on the earth Շատ է հավատում են որ աստված կվայելի մեզ երկնքում բայց ոչ հիմա երբ մենք այս երկրի վրա ենք Now this is a very important biblical uh, principle Սա շատ կարևոր աստվածություն չան սկզբունք է There's a great difference between rebellion and spiritual immaturity կա շատ մեծ տարբերություն ապստամբության եւ հոգեվոր անհասունության միջև that some people are rebellious against god but others are spiritually immature and that's not the same as rebellion կան մարդիկ ովքեր ապստամբում են աստուծեն բայց կան մարդիկ ովքեր դեռ հոգեվոր հասուն չեն եւ սա նույնը չէ ինչ ապստամբությունը that we can be very sincere in our relationship with the lord and be immature Մենք կարող ենք շատ անկեղծ լինել աստծո այդ մեր փոխհարաբերությունների մեջ, բայց լինել շատ ոչ հասուն մեր նույն ժամանակ։ But this is not the same thing as rebellion. Բայց նույն բանը չէ, երբ որ մարդը ապստամբում է աստծո դեմ։ Sometimes it looks the same outwardly, but it's a very different heart. Երբ հիմա արտակնապես դա շատ նման է, բայց ներքուստ է լիովին տարբեր բաներին։ That God looks down at his spiritually immature children he actually enjoys the relationship with them. Եթե որ աստված նայում է դեպի իր հոգեվոր ոչ հասուն զավակներին իրականում նա վայելում է շփումը նրանց հետ. Many people have the idea that God is mad at them or sad at them all the time. Շատ մարդիկ մտածում են որ աստված մշտապես զայրացած են նրանց վրա եւ մշտապես տխուր են նրանց պատճառով եւ նրանց վարքի պատճառով Yeah just tell him it's too bright it's too hot it's yeah 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 I need to bring this lower down here yeah cuz it's distracting yeah Many people understand that God is is uh they think that God is mad at them or God is sad at them Շատ մարդիկ մտածում են որ աստված կամ բարկացած են նրանց վրա կամ տխրում են նրանց պատճառով But actually God enjoys us even while we're maturing բայց իրականում աստված վայելում է մեզ նույնիսկ երբ մենք գտնում ենք մեր ոչ հասուն ընթացքում Let's look at the at the second longing that God put in the human heart Եկեք տեսնենք երկրորդ ձգտումը որը աստված դրել է մեր սրտում It's the longing to be fascinated Դա ինչ որ բանով հրապուրվելու ձգտումն է There's a craving in our spirit to be fascinated Կա ձգտում մեր ներսում որ մենք հրապուրվենք կամ տալվենք կամ կլանվենք ինչ որ բանով To be to have marvel in awe and to be filled with wonder in our heart The secular entertainment industry has identified this longing in the human heart And they have exploited this longing uh, to their profit but to the destruction of many people Եվ նրանք շահագործել են այս ձգտումը որպեսի եկամուտ ստանան դրանից բայց դրանով կործանում են շատ մարդ կանց But King David understood this Բայց Դավիդ հագավորը հասկացավ սա He said this one thing I desire Նա ասաց մեկ բան կա որ ես փափագում եմ That I would behold the beauty of the Lord որ ես նայեմ տիրոջ գեղեցկությանը God put a longing in the human heart to be fascinated and god is the one that fascinates us most աստված դրել է ձգտում մարդու սրտում որպեսի մենք գրավենք ինչ որ բանով եւ աստված է որ ամենա շատ է գրավում է մեզ that if we don't live with a sense of awe որ եթե մենք չենք ապրում այդ երկյուղացու then we will live aimless and we will live spiritually bored այդ դեպքում մենք ապրում ենք աննպատակ կյանքով եւ հոգեվորապես ձանձրույթի մեջ a spiritually bored believer is very vulnerable to the enemy հոգեվորապես ձանձույթ ապրող հավատացյալը շատ խոցելի է թշնամու համար The God the Holy Spirit he wants to fascinate our heart with the person of Jesus Եվ աստված սուրբ հոգին սուրբ հոգի աստված նա ցանկանում է հրապուրել եւ գրավել մեր սիրտը Հիսուս Քրիստոսին There is nothing more powerful than when God reveals God to the human spirit Չկա ավելի զորավոր բան քան երբ աստված հայտնում է աստծուն մարդու հոգուն 
And this longing to be fascinated will never go away. And so people, they try to fulfill this outside of their relationship with God. And they try all types of entertainment. And I am not against all entertainment. I think some of it can be edifying. But entertainment will never satisfy the human heart, never. But the problem is God created us with a longing for fascination. That we end up living bored if we don't have awe, if we don't have wonder in our life. And so David understood this principle. He said this one thing I do all the days of my life. I focus on encountering the beauty of God. And we understand God's beauty through the Word and through creation by the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit desires to actually fill us with awe and wonder. This is very important because if we don't have it, we live bored and we live aimless. And a spiritually bored believer is very vulnerable to the enemy. And I notice that many believers are spiritually bored. They love Jesus. They want to go to heaven when they die. They even want the Lord to use them a little bit on the earth right now. But there's a big emptiness in their spiritual life. They don't feed their own heart on the Word of God. They live from sermon to sermon, Sunday to Sunday, and throughout the week, they think about Jesus a little bit, but they mostly are bored in their relationship with God. And the Holy Spirit says, I created you in such a way where you need to be fascinated. And I have the power to fascinate you. Because nothing is more powerful than when God reveals God to the human heart. And God the Holy Spirit will reveal God the Son and God the Father through the written word. I love to open my Bible. I say, Holy Spirit, you are the great teacher. Escort me into the deep things of the beauty of God. I cannot understand them unless you inspire me and escort me. And the Holy Spirit, he longs for the invitation to do this for us. And so this second longing, the longing to be fascinated, will never go away. But we can satisfy it in our relationship with God in part in this age and fully in the age to come. Each of these seven longings are only partially fulfilled by the Spirit in our heart in this age. But they are totally fulfilled in the resurrection. And this is not a small thing. That for billions of years we will live fascinated. I want to begin the journey of fascination in this age. I don't want to wait till the age to come. Just like the longing to be enjoyed by God. 
I want to have the confidence that he enjoys his relationship with me. It's not enough that he technically loves me, but he actually enjoys us. Even in our immaturity, he enjoys us. He does not enjoy rebellion, but he understands immaturity. And the, and the difference is the sincerity of our heart. Like we can enjoy our relationship with our children when they're immature. We disagree with an area of their behavior. We even correct it and we uh, we bring correction to that area. But we still enjoy the child. We still enjoy the relationship with the child. And though God will correct an area in our life, but he sees the cry in our heart to be fully his. And so we have immaturity, but he doesn't view immaturity the same as rebellion. But the enemy will come and he will whisper in our ear. He says, you're just a hopeless hypocrite. God is angry at you. You are rebellious. God is finished with you. He's very, very grieved at you. But the truth is, you are sincerely trying to obey the Lord. And we have immaturity in our life. That's not the same as rebellion. Now I'm speaking to believers that seek sincerely to obey the Lord. And as parents, we can enjoy the relationship of our children when we disagree with an area of their behavior. If we can, can uh, see the difference between rebellion and immaturity, how much more can God see it? We think we can enjoy our child, but God cannot enjoy us but our, his love is much stronger than ours. God's correction is not rejection. God can correct an area of our behavior but still enjoy the relationship with us. And he put this craving in our spirit to be enjoyed by him. And the enemy wants to keep us confused all the time about this. So that we, we feel rejected, we feel condemned. And we want to run from the Lord instead of to the Lord when we discover our weakness. We want to run and hide because we, there's something in us that longs to be enjoyed. If we have the idea that God doesn't enjoy us, we don't even want to be in his presence. Like Adam in the Garden of Eden, he went and hid by the trees. But the Lord says, this is unnecessary. I have given you the gift of righteousness. You have full acceptance in my presence. And when you discover your weakness and immaturity, you don't have to run from me, you can run to me. Because I actually delight in my relationship with you. I see your weakness. I see your failure. But I see your sincere desire to obey me in that very area. 
And when I understood that the enemy tries to confuse me on this subject, then it gives me greater confidence that God does actually enjoy me even in my weakness. This one truth changed my life very dramatically some years ago. And then this second longing, the longing to be fascinated. When I understood it was not evil that I wanted to be entertained and fascinated. That the fascinating God created this longing in me so that I would behold him. But I don't want to try to satisfy that longing by uh, secular entertainment. Because it will never work. I was created to be awestruck, so were you. The, the third longing that I want to talk about that God put into the human spirit is the longing to be beautiful. Now that's a, a strange way to say it. Men don't think of wanting to be beautiful. Men want to be cool, not beautiful. But it's the same longing. The beautiful God created a longing for beauty in the human spirit. And some people, when they want to go deep in the Lord, and they have this longing to be beautiful, they, they try to repent of it. They say, this is an evil desire. And the Lord says, no, no, I actually put that longing in you. In Isaiah 61, verse 3, he gives his people beauty for ashes. That the beauty that God possesses is the very beauty he imparts to his people. Now there is physical beauty. And there is spiritual beauty. But both of them God has promised to his people. You say, wait a second. I don't look very beautiful. And you may not look very beautiful in this age. Compared to somebody else, I don't know. But I promise you one thing. For billions and billions and billions of years, you will have indescribable physical beauty. For 99.9999999% of your life, because you're going to live for billions of years. 99.999% of your life, you will possess indescribable physical beauty. So the very longing for physical beauty is not evil in itself. We can try to repent of it. We can try to be happy. Say, I just want to be ugly and happy. This is what I'm trying to do. And, and I tell people, this will never work. God actually created that longing in your heart. In this age, he imparts spiritual beauty. In 1 Peter chapter 3, God says that very precious in his sight is the incorruptible beauty he puts in his people. Now, 
It's spiritual in this age. But even when we have the peace and joy of God, it does affect our physical appearance. And so it does impact us physically somewhat in this age. But the part I want you to understand is that the beautiful God put the longing for beauty inside of you. For spiritual and physical beauty. And he says, I will give you beauty for ashes. And there's a number of verses in the Bible where the beauty of the Lord Lord will be upon his people. And so my point is this. When we see the longing for beauty that arises in our heart, the enemy comes and says, you are sinful, you're filled with pride, that's why you want this. And you could say, no, the beautiful God created us in his image and this longing is from him. Now, again, this is very important what I will say next. The enemy wants us to pursue physical beauty in a way outside the will of God. And some people are so obsessed with physical beauty of this age, it actually is destructive. We can, we must repent of that obsession. If, if that obsession is in you. But that's not the same thing as repenting of the longing. So the longing to be enjoyed by God. Uh, the, the, the assurance that we're enjoyed by God. The longing to be fascinated. The longing for spiritual, for, I mean the longing for beauty. These are from the Lord. But the enemy wants to confuse us all the time on these subjects. And, and when we try to go deep in God, then we try to repent of all of these longings. And the Lord says, you can't get free of those longings. I put in them in you forever. You can get free of pursuing them outside of the will of God. But, but the longing ex it itself is an expression of God's creative genius. The longing itself was put in you to make you have deep partnership with God. This longing draws us to God when we fulfill it in the biblical way. Number four longing. The longing to be great. Many people are confused by this longing. We can repent of trying to be great the wrong way. But you can never get free of the longing for greatness or the longing for success. The great God created you with a longing for greatness. And that longing, like the other ones, is only completely fulfilled in the age to come. But the longing itself is very important to identify that it's from the Lord. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus said, Whoever does and teaches my word, 
he shall be called great in my kingdom. This is a very important uh, biblical promise. Now notice he says whoever. This is without any regard to your education or your economics or your gifting. He says, if this person will do and teach my word, this person will be called great in the kingdom of God. That God will pronounce over them that their life choices, he considered them as great. That when you stand before the Lord on the last day, the Lord says, I will declare about your life that your life choices, the quality of your life was great in my sight. This is a remarkable promise. Now, if we look, if we seek to be great in the eyes of men in this age, if we seek to do this in a wrong way, now this is something called pride that we repent of. It is okay if God makes you great in man's eyes. That's okay. It doesn't matter ultimately. Because the only thing that matters is if God calls our life great on the last day. But notice, he says, whoever that does and teaches my word, I will call them great on that day. Without regard to how much education you have. You may have no education. You may have no special gifting. You, you may have no ministry impact on a large number of people. You may have no recognition by, by other people. You may have no money at all. But if you do God's word and teach others to do it, the Lord says that I will call your life great on that day. This is a remarkable reality. Anybody can be great in God's eyes. Anybody can be great. No education. No money. No recognition from people. No special giftings. But if I obey God from my heart, and I teach other people to, the Lord says, that's all you need to do. This invitation is open to everyone in the human race. This is fantastic. Now, what does it mean that you do the word, will of God, you do God's will and teach others? It doesn't mean that you have a microphone and you preach on Sunday morning. You may teach one or two people. It may be the children in your neighborhood. It may be one or two friends. It may be your grandchildren. And teaching doesn't mean preaching, but it means conversationally you're talking to them about doing God's will. This is not talking about having a great teaching gift. This is about using your influence to persuade other people to obey God. Maybe you say only two people in the whole world are listening to me. The Lord says, that's okay, this promise still works for you. I didn't say you had to have a great impact, I just said you had to use your influence to get people to do the will of God. There are several other times in the Gospels 
where Jesus exhorted us and promised us, promised us about greatness. But some people, when they talk about greatness, they only say repent of wanting to be great. I say you can't repent. You can't get rid of that desire. Maybe you want to use the word successful instead of great. You may never be great in the eyes of men in this age. But I remind you, you will live billions and billions and billions of years. I look at this promise. And I said, Lord, I, I want this promise. I want to be great in your eyes. And what this means is that God would call your life choices great. I said, I will endure persecution. I will endure ridicule in this age. I will take a stand for the truth, even in the church, if that causes people to be against me. Yes, as long as I know that this is a promise, I'm going for this promise. I told the young people at our Bible school, I said, I want to be very, very great. They went, oh, because they misunderstood. Of course, I said it on purpose just to confuse them for a minute. And I said, said, and you should desire the same thing. We want to do it God's way through servanthood humility. We want to do it in God's timing. Greatness is mostly in the, uh, in the age to come. Maybe a little bit in this age, but that doesn't really matter. I mean, don't be against it, but don't make it the goal of your life. My goal is not to have a, a big famous ministry. My goal is to have a faithful ministry, not a famous one. I've had people say, the Lord is opening big doors for you. I said, that is not going to impress him when I stand before him on the last day. God is not going to ask me, was I famous? He's going to ask me, was I faithful? And in Matthew chapter 5, verse 19, I'm going for this promise. And every one of you, this promise is for you if you want it. We have to pursue it through humility, through servanthood, through sacrificial obedience. But still, I'm not confused. It's about being God calling my life great. Longing number five is to have intimacy but without any shame. There's a longing in the human spirit to be known. There's a longing in our spirit that we would be known and understood. And that we would have no shame with the full knowledge of who we are. That the opposite of this longing is loneliness. Many, many people feel very alone because they don't have any sense of intimacy with anyone. I'm talking about emotional, relational intimacy. I'm not talking about sexual intimacy. Some people have sexual relationship, but they have no intimacy at the heart level. And they live very, very alone. With many people around them, but very lonely inside. 
And that loneliness is painful. Why is loneliness painful? Because you were created with a longing for intimacy. But intimacy is terrifying. Because if somebody knows everything, maybe I will be embarrassed and be put to shame. And the Lord says, uh, I see every part of your life. I see the part of your life that's misunderstood and that is unnoticed by many other people. There are many things in your life that are un good things that are other people do not notice. Or there's things in your life that are good that people misunderstand. But the Lord says, I see all of your secret sacrifices to obey me. Think of the times that, think of the times you were attempted to compromise. But you said no before the Lord. Nobody saw your resistance of that compromise. But the Lord says, I want you to know. I see all of your costly sacrifices. The Lord says, I want you to know I celebrate your victories that nobody else sees. I share in your pain that nobody else understands. I understand your failures and your struggles that nobody else knows about. In Psalm 103, King David said, Psalm 103, King David said that God understands our weakness and he understands our human frailty. And through, and through the mercy of God, he says, I see your struggle and I don't cast you off. Longing number six, belonging to be wholehearted. The longing, the longing to give everything to the relationship. This is the power to be passionate. We were created to be wholehearted. If you have nothing to die for, then you have nothing to live for. If, if your relationship with the Lord is not worthy of you giving everything to, if you are only relating to the Lord partially just to make it to heaven when you die, then your heart or your emotions will not function in a proper way. You were created to be wholehearted. And when we live passive in our relationship with the Lord, it doesn't work. It leaves us frustrated and empty and it leaves us feeling alone. It makes us live spiritually bored. But when we bring our all into the relationship, then as humans, that's the only way we can function right. I've had many people over the years tell me, well, I tried Christianity. It didn't really work. 
I said, you didn't really try Christianity. You tried how to be forgiven and live for yourself. I said, Christianity is not an offer to be forgiven and then live for yourself. I said, that's dead religion. That's not biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity that we bring all of our heart, all of our strength into the relationship. I tell them, you've never tried that. And I'm not saying that to condemn them. I'm saying that so they understand their heart. I go, the reason you're bored because you were created by God to be wholehearted and you're not wholehearted for anything. You cannot live without being wholehearted, without being broken and lonely and depressed and uh, bored. And that's good news. Because if Christianity is not working, it's because we're not really doing the biblical Christianity. That's not a, con- a condemning statement. That's a good news statement. Because I tell people in the church, maybe you've never really tried biblical Christianity. They say, well, I've grown up in the church. I'm a pastor. I'm a leader. I'm a worship leader. I said, that doesn't mean you've done biblical Christianity. Just because you have a gifting that gives you a position in the church doesn't mean you're wholehearted. So the good news, the good news, if you will live wholehearted, then that dullness and that boredom will begin to leave your life. This is an exciting way to live. And just one more minute, the seventh longing. The longing to make a significant impact. I don't mean a big impact where thousands of people are touched by your ministry. That's not what I mean. But a longing to make a difference that lasts forever. If I can impact a few people and that impact lasts forever, then my life has meaning every day. Jesus said, if you give someone a cup of cold water in my name, he said, I promise you, I will remember that forever and I will reward you. The smallest act of service in his name he remembers it forever it's not you don't have to lead worship or preach to thousands of people you don't have to have a, the biggest business in your country But if you serve people and give a cup of cold water and you have a servant's heart, the the Lord says you're doing things that will last forever. Your life is important right now because I will remember that forever. And we have this longing for a long-term impact and the Lord answers that longing in our heart. So we have this longing to be enjoyed by God. This longing to be fascinated. This longing for to be beautiful. 
the longing to be great the longing for intimacy with no shame the longing to be wholehearted the longing to make a relevant impact and to have meaning in my everyday life the Lord says I put every one of those longings in you you're not supposed to repent of those longings you're supposed to pursue them in the biblical way and they will be fulfilled in part in this age but in fullness in the age to come but even in part in this age is still very powerful I mean when I feel enjoyed by God when I feel even a little bit fascinated by God when I feel my what I do in this age God will remember it forever this changes the way I view day after day. Amen and amen. Let me pray over you. I'm going to invite you to stand. Lord, I ask you by the Spirit of grace, I ask you to release spiritual understanding of these truths. Lord, that they would walk in the fullness of what you've called them to. That they could be confident with no condemnation about these areas. And no confusion from the enemy. And I bless them in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. Bless you. <laughs>